Section 7 of The Notting Hill Mystery by Charles Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 7. Item 1. Statement of Mr. Henderson. In the concluding portion of the evidence we have now a double object in view. First, to lay before you the various links by which the circumstances already detailed are connected into a single chain, and, secondly, to elucidate the general bearing of the whole upon the particular case of the death of Madame R., into which it is my more immediate duty to inquire. It was this apparent connection with the entire story which first led me to investigate matters otherwise quite beyond my province, and you will, I have no doubt, after reading the evidence, concur in the propriety of my so doing. It is unfortunate that, in this important part of the case, as previously with regard to the no less important point of the suspicious circumstances attendant on Madame R.'s first illness at Bognor, the evidence of the principal witnesses is open to very grave question. It is not indeed, as it then, that the moral character of the individuals themselves rests under any suspicion, for, so far as I have been able to learn, both the servant of all work and her lover, John Stiles, are perfectly respectable people, while the young man, Aldridge, though certainly a foolish and perhaps rather a dissipated young fellow, has a very fair character from the house of business in which he is now employed. But the evidence of the two former is, as will be seen, greatly diminished in value by the circumstances under which it was obtained, whilst in the latter there is so clear a suspicion of animus as cannot but throw still greater doubts upon evidence in itself sufficiently questionable, and rendered yet more so by other circumstances which will hereafter more fully appear. It was this man Aldrich, whose letter, as you will remember, led to the investigation, of which the result is now before you, and his statement hereto annexed, that first gave substance to the suspicion of foul play on the part of the Baron, and in conjunction with the discovery of the enclosed papers, subsequently induced me to extend my inquiries to the cases of Mr. and Mrs. Anderton. I confess that, notwithstanding the doubt with which his statement is surrounded, I am still inclined to accept it as substantially true, though possibly somewhat coloured by personal feeling against the Baron. The point, however, has seemed to me of sufficient importance to justify the occupying of a considerable portion of this present division of the case with such evidence as I have been able to gather respecting the circumstances of his final ejectment, and it will be for you to determine between the story as told himself and that of Baron R. With regard to the other two witnesses, who, by one of those singular coincidences that in criminal cases seem so often to occur, are able to confirm in some degree the evidence of Aldridge, there is, I think, less difficulty. They had certainly no business where they were, but the circumstances are such as to fully acquit them of any felonious intent, while even had such existed, it would be difficult to see how the fact of such intent could have exercised any influence over their present statements. It is moreover quite clear that there has been no collusion upon the subject. I have now only to refer, in conclusion, to the fragment of paper found in the Baron's room in Russell Place, and the marked copy of the Zoist, belonging to the late Mr. Anderton, to which Mr. Morton referred in his statement, as having formed the subject of discussion at Mr. Anderton's house on the evening of the 13th of October, 1854. The first of these is a portion of a letter which I have endeavoured so far as possible to complete. Admitting that I have done so correctly, and coupling it with the fact of the visit which, as I have been able to ascertain, was paid by foreign lady to the Baron very early in the morning, following the death of Madame R., it appears to throw no inconsiderable light upon the extraordinary circumstances of the death of Madame R., the bearing of the latter upon the case will be perhaps less clear. I have no hesitation in admitting that when the connection first suggested itself to my own mind, I at once dismissed it as too absurd to be entertained for a moment, but I feel bound to add that the further my inquiries have progressed, the more strongly this apparent connection has forced itself upon me as the only clue to a maze of coincidences 
such as it has never before been my lot to encounter, and that while even now unable to accept it as a fact, I find it still more impossible to thrust it altogether on one side. I have therefore left the matter for your decision, merely pointing out, as I have before, in the opening portion of my report, that even admitting the influence of these passages upon the mind of the Baron, and the ultimate success of the plan founded upon their suggestion, that success, however extraordinary, may not necessarily involve, as at first appears, the admission of those monstrous assertions of the mesmeric journal on which it was based. With these observations, I now submit to your consideration the concluding portion of the evidence, after which it will only be necessary for me to take a brief review of the whole case, before leaving it finally in your hands. Item 2. Statement of Mrs. Jackson. My name is Mary Jackson. I live in Goswell Street, City Road. I am a monthly and sick nurse. In June 1856 I was engaged to nurse Madame R. I was recommended to the Baron by Dr. Marsden, who lodged in the same house. I have often nursed for him. Madame R. was not very ill. I don't think she was ill enough to require a nurse. Of course, she was the better for one. Everybody always is. But she could have done without one. I came by the Baron's wish. He was anxious, like. The poor gentleman was very fond of his wife. I never saw such a good husband. I am sure no other husband would have done what he did, and she so cold to him. I don't think she cared about him at all. She hardly ever spoke to him, unless it was when he spoke first. She never spoke much. She always seemed frightened, especially when the Baron was there. She certainly seemed to be afraid of him, but I can't tell why. He was always kind to her. He was the nicest and most civil-spoken gentleman I ever knew. It was not that he was not particular. Quite the reverse. I wish all husbands were half so particular, and then the nurses wouldn't so often get into trouble. Everything used to be done like clockwork. Every morning he used to give me a paper, what was to be given in the day. I mean medicine and food. A list of everything, with the time it was to be taken. Everything used to be ready, and I used to give it regular. No one else ever used to give anything. The Baron never gave anything himself. Never at all. I'm quite sure of that. He used to say that it was nurse's business, and so it is. He often said he had seen so much sickness, he had learned never to interfere with the nurse and I only wish all other gentlemen would do the same. He used to be very particular about the physic. We always have the bottles for our perquisite. We get a shilling a dozen for them all round if they are clean. The Baron objected to this. He allowed me a shilling a dozen instead. The bottles were all put away in a cupboard. They never used to be quite emptied. The Baron always made a point of having fresh in before the old was quite finished. He said he always liked to have them to refer to in case of accident or mistake. He was a very careful gentleman. I nursed Madame R. every day until her recovery. I am quite certain that during the hours I was there, nothing was ever given to her but what passed through my hands. Item 3. Statement of Mrs. Ellis. My name is Jane Ellis. I am a sick nurse, and live in Good Street, Tottenham Court Road. In about the end of July, 1856, I was engaged as night nurse to Madame R. Perhaps she did not exactly require one. She was ill, but she could help herself. At times she was very ill. It was much more comfortable for her, and she could afford it. Baron R. never seemed to spare anything for her. She was generally worst at night. The worst attacks used to come on about every fortnight. It was generally on a Saturday. I took turn and turn about with Mrs. Jackson. She took the day work, and I took the night. I used to come at ten o'clock and leave at breakfast time. During that time I was never out of the room. It was the Baron's particular desire. When I first came he made it a condition that I should never leave the room and never go to sleep. He was the most particular gentleman I ever nursed for. I have nothing whatever to say against him. Quite the contrary. He was always civil and pleasant spoken, and behaved most handsome as gentlemen should do. He was uncommon fond of the lady. She didn't seem to care much about him. She was ill, poor soul, and could not care about anybody. She seemed quite frightened like. When the Baron came into the room, she used to follow him about with her eyes, as if she was afraid of him. I never heard him say an unkind word. Other times she would lie quite quiet, and not speak a word for hours. She seemed afraid of everybody. If I moved about the room, I could see her eyes following me about and watching me everywhere. 
I think it was part of her complaint. The Baron was most attentive. I never saw such an attentive husband. He used to lie in the next room. It opened into the bedroom, and he always had the door wide open. He was a wonderfully light sleeper. If either of us spoke a word, he would be in the room directly to ask what was the matter. I couldn't even move across the room, but what he would hear it. He was a wonderful man. He seemed to live almost without sleep. I think it must have been the meat did it. He used to eat enormous quantities of meat. I never saw a man eat so much. When I first came he used to joke with me about it. Madame R. was not so bad then, and we used to talk sometimes. He told me it was because he was a mesmerizer. I don't believe in mesmerism. I told him so. He didn't say anything. He only laughed. One night he offered to send me to sleep. That was when I had been there about a week. I said he might try if he could. He looked hard at me ever so long, and made some odd motions with his hands. I did go to sleep. I don't believe it was mesmerism. Of course not. I think it was looking at his eyes. I told him so. He asked if he should do it again. He did it once more. That was the night after. I went to sleep then almost directly. Of course I knew it was not mesmerism, but I couldn't help it. He did not talk about it any more. He only said that I must take care not to go to sleep of my own accord. I did drop asleep three or four times after that. That was not from anything the Baron did. He was not in the room at the time. He must have been in the next room. I suppose the door was open. It always was. The first time I went to sleep about a week after we had talked about the mesmerism. It was on a Saturday night, or Friday, I'm not quite sure which. It was one of the nights when Madame R. was so ill. She had gone to sleep at about eleven o'clock. She seemed very well then. She was sleeping quite quiet. I supposed I must have dropped off. I was awoke by a moaning in a sleep. That was about one o'clock. She soon woke up in great pain, and had a very bad attack. The Baron came into the room, just as I woke. Something woke him, and he came in directly. He told me what it was that woke him. It was me snoring, he said so. I fell asleep again a fortnight after, in the same way. The Baron was not there. Madame R. was asleep. She had not slept for many nights. I must have dropped off in a doze, hearing her so nicely asleep. The Baron woke me. That was about one o'clock. He was very much displeased. He told me Madame R. had been walking in her sleep and might have killed herself. He said she went into the kitchen. I am certain that was where he said. I can swear it. He asked what I had taken for supper and tasted what was left of the beer. He seemed very much vexed and disturbed. I was very sorry and promised to be very careful another time. I never had such a thing happen in any other case. I told him so. He said he would look over it that time, but it must never happen again. He went upstairs afterwards. I think it was to speak to somebody. He said somebody had seen her, I think. Madame R. was ill that night. She began to moan while we were talking, and had a very bad attack. The Baron said she must have caught cold, and I am afraid she did. I determined to be particularly careful for the time to come. I was very careful for some time, particularly when she was asleep. She hardly slept at all for two weeks, but when she did I was very careful. At the end of that time I must have fallen asleep again. I was hardly aware of it. I know I must have been asleep, because when I looked at the clock it was two hours later than I thought. Madame R. was ill again that night. I was very much vexed. I began to think somebody was playing tricks upon me. It was so strange coming every fortnight. I did not tell the Baron. I know it was wrong, but I was afraid. Next fortnight I was on the lookout. Madame R. went to sleep again. I was determined not to go to sleep. I thought somebody must have played tricks with the beer, so I wouldn't drink it. I ate no supper, and drank nothing but some strong green tea I made for myself. I was quite sure the tea must keep me awake. It did not. I awoke with a great start about one o'clock, and found Madame R. bad again, as usual. I was very much bothered about it. I made up my mind to tell the Baron if it happened again. It did happen again, but I did not tell him. Madame R. was so bad that I was really afraid, and after that it never happened again, and she got well. I know I ought to have told the Baron. I am very sorry I did not. Such a thing never happened to me before. Of course I have slept in a sick room before, but not when it was against orders. I was there about three months. I dropped asleep in that way, I think, six times, but I am not quite sure. It was always while Madame R. was asleep. 
She was always bad afterwards. I did not say anything to her about it, or about her walking. The Baron particularly desired I would not. He said it would frighten her. He never asked me again whether I had been asleep, or I would have told him. I was really going to tell him once or twice, but something always happened to stop me. I can swear that nothing of the kind ever happened to me before. There must have been something wrong. I have sick nursed twenty years, and have the best characters from many doctors and patients. Footnote. This I find to be the case. R. H. Item 4. Statement of Mr. Westmacott. London, 20th of September, 1857. Sir, I have the honour to inform you that in compliance with your request I have submitted to the most careful and searching examination and analysis the contents of three dozen and seven, forty-three, medicine files forwarded by you for that purpose. The number and contents of these files correspond exactly with the prescriptions, etc., furnished by Messrs. Andrews and Empson. Footnote. The chemists from whom the Baron obtained his medicines. And after the most exact analysis, I have been unable to detect the slightest trace of either arsenic, antimony, or any similar substance. I have the honour to be your most obedient servant, Thomas Westmacott, analytical chemist. Item 5. Statement of Henry Aldrich. My name is Henry Aldrich. I'm a clerk in the employ of Messrs. Simpson & Co., City. In the summer of 1856 I came to lodge at Mrs. Brown's in Russell Place. I did not come there first as a lodger, but as a friend of her son. I'd known him in Australia. We were together in the same store in Melbourne, and got to be great friends. We did not come home in the same ship. That is a mistake. I came home some weeks before he did, and was in Liverpool when he arrived. I think he came in the Lightning, but cannot be sure. I used to board so many ships that I can't call to mind. I was in a Liverpool house then for a time, and it was my duty to board every ship as she came up. I agreed to go with him to London. I could not go directly, as I had to give notice to my employers, but I was to follow him. He asked me to stay with him for his wedding at his mother's house, and I did so. That was how I first came to Russell Place. After that he arranged with his mother for me to take a room regularly, and I was to pay so much a week, and so much more when I got a situation. I was not aware of the Baron making any objection. I saw very little of him. I slept on the floor above, and was always very careful not to make any noise on account of Madame R. She was ill, and I took particular care not to disturb her. I used sometimes to be out late. I have been intoxicated in my life. Not very often. Not at all while I was at Russell Place. I have been out to my friends while I was there, and have drunk wine and spirits, but never to be the worse for it. I may have been merry. I don't say I have not been once or twice a little excited with wine. What I mean is that I have never been in such a state as not to be quite conscious of what I was doing, and quite able to control myself. I'm quite certain that I never made the slightest disturbance, or could have done so without knowing it. That I will swear to. I believe the Baron accused me of it to Mrs. Brown. He spoke to her several times about it, and wished her to turn me out. She said she had never seen anything wrong, and couldn't say anything till she did, because I was her son's friend. At last he got her to do it. The reason was I was found by a policeman on the doorstep at twelve o'clock one night, insensible. The policeman knocked and rang, and woke up the house, and the Baron said I was drunk. I was perfectly sober. I had nothing whatever but one small bottle of ale. The facts of the case were these, and I will swear to them. I had been kept late at our office with some of his correspondence, and had then walked home with another clerk from the same office, William Wells, having taken nothing but one small bottle of ale, which I had at a public house in High Holborn, as I felt quite tired. Wells had some brandy and water. He left me at the corner of Tottenham Court Road, and when I got to Russell Place I tried to open the door with my latch key, but the latch was fastened. Then I rang the bell, and I could not make it sound, and the handle came out loose, as if the wire was broken. I tried the key once more, and was just thinking whether I should not go to some place, as I did not like to disturb Madame R. by knocking, when the door was opened from the inside. I turned round to go in, when something was thrust into my face, and I can remember nothing more. I must have fallen down insensible, and the policeman found me. This is the truth. I could not see who opened the door. 
there was a street lamp close to the area gate, but the person was in the shadow. I cannot account for it. I made sure at the time it was a trick of the Baron to get me turned out. I think so still, but I am not so sure of it as I was. What I mean is that, on reflection, I don't think it is certain enough to accuse him of such a thing. I will swear to the truth of what I have said. I will swear that I was perfectly sober, as sober as I am now. My employers and Will Wells can prove it. I do not know why the Baron should have wished so much to turn me out. We never had words about anything. I don't think I ever spoke to him but once. I mean, not more than good morning or such like. That was on the occasion about which I wrote to the assurance office after Madame R's death. It was one Saturday night. I had had a half holiday and been up to Putney in a boat with some friends. We had drunk a good deal of beer and shandy gaff, but I was not drunk. I was quite sober, though perhaps a little excited. Nothing to speak of. I got home at about eleven o'clock. I had a latch key then, but the lock was hampered, and when I got back home I found the servant girl sitting up to let me in. I went up very quietly, not to disturb Madame R. I saw a bedroom door ajar as I passed. The door of the room next to it was wide open, and there was some sort of lamp burning. No one moved or said anything as I went by. I took off my shoes to go more softly but the house was old, and it was impossible to move without the stairs creaking a little. The stairs below the Baron's room were stone and did not creak. I had a candle which I shaded carefully with my hand. I went to bed, but I suppose I was overtired, for I could not get to sleep. The night was very hot. When I had been in bed about a couple of hours, I thought I would have a good wash and see if that would cool me. I got up and went to the wash-hand stand. I found the jug empty. The maid often forgot to fill it. I took the jug and went out on the landing to fill it at the tap. I went very softly not to disturb Madame R. As I got on to the landing I saw someone coming out of her room and went to look over the banister. From the landing of my room you can see that of the floor below. I looked over and saw that it was Madame R. She was in her dressing gown but had no candle. She went to the stairs and there I lost sight of her. As I watched her pass the door of the other room I saw the shadow of a man's head and shoulders upon the wall, as if somebody was watching her. I leaned against the banisters to watch her, and it creaked, and the shadow vanished directly. When I looked up again it was gone, and at first I thought it must have been fancy, but I am quite certain about it now. I was only doubtful for a moment. It was so sudden. I could swear to it now. I saw it perfectly plain. I saw it all the time Madame R was going down the first flight of stairs, about twelve of them. She was at the corner when I turned and leaned over to watch her. I felt convinced that Madame R was walking in her sleep. The staircase was quite dark beyond the corner, and she had walked straight down. I was afraid she would hurt herself, and went down to the Baron's door. He was asleep. At least I had to knock twice. He then came to the door, and I told him what I had seen. He seemed a good deal annoyed, and at once took up the lamp and went down the stairs. I looked over the banister and saw him go down. From that place you can see right down to the door which leads to the kitchen stairs. There is a glass partition between them and the hall. I saw him go in at the door, and I saw the light through the glass as he went part of the way downstairs. Presently he came up again and stood back from the door, while Madame R came up past him and walked up the stairs. Then, then he followed her. When I saw her coming up, I went back to my own landing and looked over. She went back to her own room, fast asleep still, as it seemed to me, and he followed. I heard whispering in the room, and then the Baron came up to me. He thanked me very much for telling him, and said that Madame R had gone down into the kitchen, and was just coming out as he got to the foot of the stairs. He particularly begged me never to mention it, as it might come to her ears and do her harm, and I have never spoken of it to any one till I wrote to the assurance office. I had almost forgotten all about it when it was recalled to my mind by seeing that poor Madame R had killed herself in a sleepwalking fit. I then wrote. I had no malice against the Baron, nor have I now. I don't know why he tried to turn me out. I suppose he really thought I disturbed his wife. He was very fond of her, and I dare say he was anxious and fretful about her. I was very angry at the time, but when I come to think of it, I dare say I was hard upon him. He never seemed to bear me any grudge about what I had seen. On the contrary, he always said he was very much obliged to me. This is all I know on the subject, and I can swear to the truth of every word. I am quite positive, he said, Madame R. had been into the kitchen. Item 6. 
Statement of Miles Thompson. I am a police constable. In August 1856, I used to be on night duty in Russell Place. I remember Baron R. speaking to me one night and asking me to keep a lookout as often as I could of a night to keep the street quiet. He gave me five shillings for my extra trouble. I was on the beat one night about twelve o'clock when I saw someone lying on the Baron's doorstep. It was a young gentleman, and at first I thought he was dead, but found he was only insensible. I set him up against the railings and was going to ring the bell when I saw a latch key in his hand. I tried it in the door, and it opened it directly, and I took him into the hall. I then knocked and rang till somebody came. The bell rang quite well. The Baron came down in his dressing gown, and two or three other people. I offered to go for a doctor, but the Baron said he was only drunk. I helped to carry him upstairs, and got him into bed. The Baron gave me half crown for my trouble. He seemed very much annoyed, as was natural, and said he wished I had taken the young man to the station. I think he was drunk myself. He smelt a little of beer, but not much. I helped to put him to bed, and went away. That is all I know. N.B. By letters from Messrs. Simpson and Mr. Wells, Mr. Aldridge's assertion that he was sober is borne out, up to the time of the latter's leaving him at the corner of Tottenham Court Road, certainly not more than half an hour before he was found, as above stated, by Police Constable Thompson, R.H. Item 7. Statement of John Johnson. 2. Mr. Anderson, sir, obedient to your commands, I have examined the bell wire in Russell Place, which, in my humble opinion, it have been tempered with by some hum professional, and which that how we have been took off the crank and put back all know how like, which any professional, and would be shamed for to do it. I am sure your obedient servant to command, John Johnson, Plummer and Bellanger, Tottenham Court Road, London. Item 8. Statement of Susan Turner. My name is Susan Turner. In August 1856 I was general servant to Mrs. Brown in Russell Place. I remember the night that Madame R. came downstairs. I had sat up to let Mr. Aldrich in because the latch was broken. Mistress broke it that afternoon. I don't suppose the Baron knew anything about it. Mr. Aldrich came in rather late. I cannot justly say the time. He was quite right. I mean, sober. He went straight up to bed. I did not go up to bed. My young man was in the kitchen. He is a very respectable young man upon a railway. I don't know what railway. I know he goes to Scotland sometimes with his engine, that is all. He is what they call a fireman. He was going down with a luggage train somewhere that night very late and came to see me. Mistress didn't know he was there. He came in after she was gone to bed. He was to start at two, and we sat till about one. He was just going away, and we were standing at the kitchen door when we heard somebody in the hall, and I said, Oh, Laura, that's Missus. He said, She'll be coming to look for you, and wanted me to go and meet her while he cut out by the area. I said, No, that wouldn't do by reason of it being all glass and a gas lamp at top of the area steps. Footnote. The arrangement alluded to will be seen from the accompanying plan. The inner partition is entirely of glass, while the outer has a row of large panes along the top. I pulled him along to the lumber room. The lumber room is behind the kitchen and the cellar. There are some old boxes and things there, but nobody ever goes into it. I thought my mistress would not think of looking there, and just as we got to the door we saw somebody come from the hall and down the stairs. I whispered to John, Why, that's not Mrs., that's Madam. My mistress was very tall and stout, and Madam R. was small and thin. I could see her as she came through the door, because there was some sort of light in the hall. She came right downstairs and past where we were. She went right on into the little place at the end where the Baron kept all his bottles and stuff. She did not go into the kitchen, not at all. I will swear to that. She went into the Baron's place. The laboratory, I dare say it is. I don't know. It was where all the bottles are. John and me crept up to the window and looked out. The window of the lumber room looks right into the window of the back room where the bottles are. You could see in quite plain. It was a bright moonlight night, and there was a sort of tin-looking glass over the back room window to make more light like. We saw Madam go into the room and take a bottle from a shelf. She poured out a glassful and drank it. Then she put the bottle back in its place. It was the last in the second shelf. Then she went out again, and when we turned round, we saw a light shining into the room from the kitchen stairs. It stayed there till Madam had gone past our door again, and then it went up again. And just as it got to the top of the stairs, I peeped out and saw it was the Baron. 
Madame was close behind him. I said to John, "'Why, John, there's the Baron.' He said he supposed he had come to look after his wife. After they had gone, John and me went into the bottle place. We found the glass on the table. There was a few drops of stuff in it. John and me smelt it, and it was just like wine. Tasted just like wine, too. Then we looked at the bottle. It was at the end of the second shelf. It was about half full of stuff that looked like wine. There was something in gold letters on the bottle. I can't tell what it was. It was Vin something. I know that because John and me settled it must mean wine. I think I should know the rest if I saw it. Being here shown several labels, witness picked out the following. Vin Ant Pot Tart. Designating antimonial wine, a mixture of sherry and tartar emetic. I am pretty sure that was the one. I remember it because they were such funny words. I remember John and me joking about pots and pies. The stuff in the bottle smelt just like wine. It was just like sherry wine. I did not taste that. John wouldn't let me. He said I might go and poison myself for aught I knew. We put the bottle back, and then John went away. I said nothing about it to anybody. Not even when Madam was taken ill that night. I was afraid by reason of John. I have never said a word about it to any living soul till I was asked to-day. Certainly not to Mr. Aldrich, nor he to me. I will swear to the truth of all I have said. I am quite positive that Madam never went near the kitchen. I am quite positive that the Baron must have seen her come out of the bottle-place. He was standing with the candle in his hand waiting for her. That I can swear. N.B. The statement of the young man referred to fully corroborates the above statement. The accompanying plan will make this witness's evidence more clear. Plan of basement floor of Baron R.'s lodgings, Russell Place. A.A. Windows of lumber room and laboratory referred to in the evidence of John Sanders and Mary Allen. B.B. Glass Partitions Item 9. Copy of a letter from a leading mesmerist to the compiler, with reference to the power claimed by mesmeric operators over those subjected to their influence. Dorset Square. My dear sir, many times after throwing Sarah Partons into the mesmeric state, I have willed her to go into a dark room and pick up a pin or other article equally minute, and however powerless she might be at the time out of the state was quite immaterial my will and power being employed was sufficient then mr l a paralytic under my influence without losing consciousness or undergoing any recognizable change has many times with the lame leg stepped up on to and down again from an ordinary dining-room chair this of course was a masterpiece of mesmeric manipulation I wish I could write more and better, but my eyes forbid. With kindest regards, yours most truly, D. Hands. Item 10. Fragment of letter found in the Baron's room, after the death of Madame R. Translation. They would hang thee, would they not, my poor Philip? Well, by that child, that poor little angel, who is now is it not so, Philip? Looking down on us from heaven, and whom we shall never see again, by that child I swear it to you. Once more, to-day is the thirteenth. On the fifteenth, very early in the morning, I shall be at your house. I must find you alone. You understand me? Alone in the world. Do you not well know the means? Oh, Philip, I love thee, I love thee. Knowest thou what a jealous woman is? Item 11. Extracts from The Zoist Magazine, number 47, for October 1854. Mesmeric cure of a lady who had been twelve years in the horizontal position with extreme suffering, by the Reverend R. A. F. Barrett, B.D., Senior Fellow of King's College, Cambridge. In January 1852, I was calling upon blank, when she happened to tell me that she had been in considerable pain for a fortnight past, that the only thing that relieved her was mesmerism, but the friend who used to mesmerise her was gone. I continued to mesmerise her occasionally for some months. April 21st. I kept her asleep an hour and a quarter in the morning, and the same in the evening. She said, footnote, 
In a former portion of the case we are told that this patient was clairvoyant and could see her own internal condition. R. H. Her throat looked parched and feverish. At her request I ate some of the black currant paste, which she said moistened it. She said, Before you ate, my stomach was contracted and had a queer-looking sort of moisture in it. Now the stomach is its full size and does not look shrunk, and part of the moisture is gone. I, but you could not get nourishment so? Answer, yes, I could get all my system once. April 26th. In the evening I kept her asleep one hour, and took tea for her. April 27th. I ate dinner, and she felt much stronger. I kept her asleep two hours and a quarter in the morning, and one hour in the evening, eating for her as usual. End of section 7